So actually, so Steve later on in this session is gonna be giving a talk about fake news, but I'm gonna start the session with fake news because it turns out that we do not have yet the finalized version of the ACG guidelines for ulcerative colitis. They are still embargoed. If anybody had access to them, it would have been me, and I don't. So I had to change the title and the topic of my talk, and hopefully that's okay with you guys. I changed it to Guidelines for Ulcerative Colitis, Where Are We? And it's gonna hopefully be just sort of a, a walk through the recent data and the literature to date uh, over the past couple of years, and hopefully that's gonna set the stage for what uh, Corey's gonna talk about in terms of um, severe ulcerative colitis. So, I just went back and I looked, okay, what do we have in terms of available guidelines for 2018? And it turns out that there's quite a smorgasbord out there. So, there is a guideline for five ASA suppositories written by the Japanese. Why you need a, a guideline for a therapy that you just stick up your butt doesn't seem like there would be a lot to talk about, but there it is. Thiopurines and IBD, very nice up-to-date from the folks in the UK. Biosimilars for IBD from our, our folks oh, um, in Europe. Pediatric management by Dan Turner. And uh, again, for those of us in the audience who don't necessarily do a lot of that, uh, having a helpful guideline is very, is very important. Jean Fred, who um, was the, one of the recipients of the Sherman Prize last night, has written a very brilliant uh, guideline on, um, on HSV for us, and certainly as we start using more tofacitinib, this is going to be, become very important. Iron deficiency anemia, we have a, a nice guideline as well for that. And then from the Spanish group, psychological issues. So we have much more effective therapies now, but we have not necessarily done our due diligence about the emotional health of our patients. So I want to go back a few years because I think that this ulcerative colitis pathway that was first authored by Thamos Disopoulos is actually really, really helpful to clinicians out there. It, it, it's a lot of visual um, aids, and I think that sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. So the pathway is actually made up of seven sections, and each section is devoted to a certain part of the care of an ulcerative colitis patient. So diagnosis and assessment, comorbidities and complications, stratifying the risk for a colectomy, induction and maintenance of a low risk patient, the induction and maintenance pathway for a high risk patient, therapy for high risk not in, in remission, and I think that that's where Corey's gonna take us later today, and then also the high risk inpatient, again, where Corey's going to spend some more time. So I've just here put up an example of the first pathway in terms of making a diagnosis and assessment of inflammatory status for an ulcerative colitis patient, and then the assessment of comorbidities and disease and therapy-related complications. So you can see that, that there's very nice a visual pathway here that, that one can follow, and it's not just dense verbiage. So I do refer people back to this older pathway type of guideline. So I'll just give you one quick slide on inpatient care that in my reading and trying to catch us all up with where we are with guidelines, that in terms of IV steroids, there is no consensus on whether you should do continuous infusion versus IV boluses that we talk about one milligram per kilogram of methylprednisolone or hydrocortisone at 100 QID. So again, there's not a consensus about how, how you give it or what you give. But I would say that what's considered standard is that three to five days of IV steroids and there it better be a discussion of your exit strategy needed if there is no response. And whether that is cyclosporin, whether that is surgery, whether that is rescue and fliximab has yet to be actually determined in terms of what would be standard. So. Going back and thinking about where are we and where are the gaps and what hopefully the newest ACG guideline will help us deal with, I, I found a, a couple of slides about where we should be with care in general. And the 5S principle can be applied to pretty much anything that we do in our day, whether that is ulcerative colitis or hepatitis C or just GERD. But we need to stage the disease, stratify our patients, set treatment goals, select appropriate therapy, and supervise that therapy. 
And along with that, we have the 5C strategy for management, and that's comprehensive care, collaboration, communication, clinical nurse specialists, and care pathways. So in the, in the, the rest of what I'm gonna present sort of takes that sort of um, theme into account. So we've got the 5S and then the 5C. So looking back a year or so, we have a very nice consensus guideline from Taiwan. And you know, when a lot of us started in this business, we didn't talk about IBD in Taiwan. And so now the Taiwanese have a very nice consensus guideline that they've put together. And a lot of those things actually do apply to the rest of the world. So it covers epidemiology, the diagnosis and treatment of IBD in Taiwan. And certainly in that part of the world, they have to worry more about TB and they do address it in their guideline. For latent TB, TB at least four weeks of treatment before a biologic on their panel, 83% of their experts strongly agreed that that was the rationale that should be taken. That TB testing done annually, actually two thirds of their panelists strongly agreed with that recommendation and that might be something that comes up as a topic of conversation at this meeting as to whether you really need to do it annually here in the States. Routine endoscopy is not necessary. That was 100% consensus there, that we don't need to just be scoping for the sake of scoping on a routine basis. And then interestingly, surveillance at eight years or 12 years for left-sided, only 62% strongly agreed with that statement. So that clearly there's wiggle room for what you're gonna do in terms of surveillance for those patients who make it past 10 years with their colon intact. So this is um, uh, out of the Canadian network, and for those of you who are dyslexic, this reads correctly, but for the rest of us, it should say IBD, not BID. Um, this is out, an outgrowth of the Canadian IBD network for research and growth and quality improvement. So we're starting to incorporate the concepts of quality improvement, so we get back to that 5S and the 5C. And the five things that providers and patients should question. So we're gonna hear from Chuch about patients asking and what we should know as clinicians about the environment, that, that providers and patients should question steroids for maintenance. It is not a maintenance therapy. Opioids long-term to manage pain. So patients with ulcerative colitis have discomfort, they have cramping, they should not have pain, and long-term opioids are not appropriate in that scenario. We should not prolong the use of IV steroids in hospital. Just like I said, that we, we understand pretty much that three to five days is about as long as we should give them. We should not initiate or escalate long-term medical therapies based only on symptoms, that there should be some sort of objective assessment of inflammation because we all know that about 40% of our patients also have irritable bowel syndrome, so they feel terrible, they have diarrhea, they have cramps, but they have not a speck of active inflammation. Certainly C. diff is easily in 25 to 30% of our patients who are flaring. And lastly, don't use CT to assess IBD in the acute setting unless there's a suspicion for a complication, that it really should be either a non-invasive stool marker, serum marker, or else endoscopy. So our European friends and ECHO have also done a set of uh, consensus statements um, that are just a year old. And this first one is on diagnosis and management again. Part one is on diagnosis. They deal with extraintestinal manifestations as well as pregnancy in part one. Cancer surveillance, uh, surgery, and pouch disorders. And so just some um, fun facts out of that part for you. So um, in terms of histopathology, that they recommend that there needs to be at least two biopsies from at least five sites, including the rectum separately and the TI. So what I teach my fellows is don't be a dermatologist. What do dermatologists do? They only biopsy the rash or the abnormal looking skin. For us, we should be biopsying, at least on that index endoscopy or a follow-up endoscopy, every part of the colon so that we really understand what part is truly affected. Anemia of chronic disease in the face of active inflammation is defined as a ferritin greater than 100 and a transferrin saturation less than 20%, and I think that that's important for us to have a good working definition that if you have severe C. diff in the face of IBD, that oral vancomycin is your go-to therapy. And 
that they say that early pouchoscopy is important for patients who have symptoms that are consistent with pouchitis. In another, in another part of their consensus portfolio, they talk about transitional care. And this was an expert panel of nine pediatricians and five adult gastroenterologists using the modified Delphi method to come up with consensus statements. They had 14 practice points that met greater than 80% agreement, so I've listed them here, that transition is a continuous process, successful transition takes a year or more, that a joint clinic is the actual ideal model for this, that you should only transition a patient when they are in stable remission, and that literally it does take a team. And I think that these all make sense to us, but sometimes we have to hear that to understand that that's how we're gonna operationalize this. So again, you know, as we talk about non-invasive serum markers, where are we with practical guides? So that's another way of thinking about a consensus statement or a guideline is, you know, I always like to hear the word practical in the title because it means that I'm not sifting through science, they're just gonna give me some good bullet points. So this is actually a practical guide um, that was put together just last year. Uh, six studies using, looking at fecal calprotective pro prospectively and where does it fit in our algorithm. And so interestingly, that if you have a fecal calprotectin that repeatedly is above the cutoff for your lab, that anywhere between a half and 83% of those patients have a probability of developing disease relapse over the next two to three months. So if you are doing this prospectively and using it to guide your therapy, that if a patient is repeatedly elevated that, uh, that you should be thinking ahead about therapy for them. Those with repeated normal fecal calprotectin have a very high probability of remaining in remission. So that this suggests that this may be a very helpful way to actually monitor our patients long term. Unfortunately, the ideal fecal calprotective cutoff for monitoring has not yet been identified. So that's why they're important to say that, that you have to use the cutoff uh, le uh, levels of your, of your lab to understand and be, and be consistent with the lab that you use to try to do this prospectively. All right, so uh, the French did this very nice study. Great, we have all these guidelines. I showed you seven on the first slide. So how do we implement guidelines? And are they being implemented? So this is a French study, and the investigators actually, um, uh, they recruited 10 gastroenterologists who are in private practice, and what they, they were allowed to go into those practices and actually review the records of 127 patients from their private practices. And what they were doing was they were looking looking to see whether these uh, physicians were using the up-to-date French national consensus guidelines for care of their ulcerative colitis patients. And it turns out that when they did their review that 95% of the patients that they um, were auditing fit criteria to be part of any guideline for their care. And why is that important? Because a lot of people will push back and say, well, the guidelines are fine, but my patients don't fit in the categories that were looked at in these guidelines. And so their point number one was that 95% of these patients indeed were able to be, um, to, to be cared for with the use of guidelines. There was 75% adequate correspondence, meaning that documentation in the chart looked at uh, the majority of patients actually did have um, adequate uh, medical information there. And of the 21 that were discordant away from the guidelines, that 16 of those 21 actually had acceptable rationale for why they were discordant from the guideline. And so they felt that, that their French consensus guidelines were being followed to, to a, a good portion and that it was also interesting that all 10 of these private practitioner gastroenterologists had attended IBD CME programs within the past eight months. So that it's medical education at fora like these that actually are important for folks to take back to their clinics and use the guidelines that we have. And, and that's why we have fora like these. So um, I really thought that this was intriguing too. So this is a consensus recommendation for patient-centered therapy. So now we wanna try to put their care into the hands of the patients directly. And this is the I-START approach, and this is a, a multinational initiative here. And this is the um, I-START approach, which is I support therapy access to rapid treatment. And this is used for mild to moderate flares of ulcerative colitis, and patients are trained to recognize 
recognize symptoms and self-treat with second-line therapy when optimized first line is insufficient. And what does that optimized mean? It means that they are to increase their 5-ASA dose for a flare, and if that doesn't work or if they're already at, at, at maximum doses of 5-ASA, followed by budesonide, a course of budesonide for their, uh, for their flare. So we're trying to, trying to give back to the patients potentially some of their own care. So where are the opportunities that we will be hearing about in these uh, guidelines that will be likely available online first and then in print probably in March? Uh, is the addition to tofacitinib to that algorithm, and, and my guess is that Corey's going to talk a little bit about that data that came out of Michigan for tofacitinib for the severe inpatient. Biosimilars and where do they fit in? And we've had a lot of discussion already just within one day of, about where we, we position biosimilars, where, where are the data? And then also in, in, in the spirit of the iStart program that we need to actually have patient engagement and coping mechanisms, again, because we have such effective medical therapies now that we really need to think about their emotional and psychological health because it's so intimately tied in with their GI health. And that's gonna be with the use of telemedicine and Ray Cross has done and just amazing pioneer work in this area. And then mobile apps, and, and there are multiple out there, and we, we have patients who come in and they've tracked their symptoms with their app and they wanna show you 2,700 days of their symptoms. Um, maybe we don't need that, but being able to download some of those directly into our Epic platforms, maybe that's a one, maybe one good reason for having Epic, I'm not sure yet, but um, that, uh, that mobile apps certainly will help um, engage patients and that we need to start thinking about how we're going to use those in care and, and talking about them in guidelines. And so with that, I'm actually going to end early and allow more time for, for Corey. Thank you very much.